Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. I'm so happy we have a very eminent guest. This is Professor Sas Tibor, as they say in Hungarian, but maybe for my uh, English speaking audience, we, sw we will swap the names. Professor Tibor Sas. Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me for this interview, and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. It's going to be great. I really, really enjoyed our first conversation because you talked about many important things, many things that people don't think about. And I have to say, you're a very surprising concert pianist because you seem to know a lot about music, which really surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, you know a, a staggering amount. And I, I, I remember, of course, uh, Professor Robert Levin said your, your, your articles in Vasto Continuo were important. And, um, and I think you really hit the nail on the head in many things. And you're very... Uh, forward thinking. I mean, even before all of this partimento, you were already thinking about many different things and many issues that that affect performers and interpreters. And um, so I'm very, I really enjoyed the conversation and I think we're going to have a blast today. Well, I uh, could I uh, mention something about partimento? Absolutely. Because people today, they they go with uh, well-known concepts and when they hear partimento they assume that I knew something about partimento when I made my list sonata discovery or that I knew something about partimento when I did my Mozart discovery and that's uh, completely wrong I knew nothing about partimento I simply had a musical ear and as I was doing the list sonata, and I read a little bit what other people have written, and pretty soon I realized something doesn't doesn't fit. Something is not right. And the same thing happened with Mozart. Because let's 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 go from basics. Ask any pianist what is a pianist one of the main concerns is to bring out the right hand, because the right hand usually is the melody, yes? So melody, you know, that is big word. And uh, when we say melody, we always assume that the melody is the highest pitches in a piece of music. But what I discovered is, wait a minute, if I look at the voice leading, which is in, in that piece, then, then the, the whole thing doesn't make sense. The, this bringing out the top voice does not uh, add up. Now, wait, just so, so the audience is clear, we are talking about yeah. your most recent, your, your, the, the last released article, where you talk about basically uh, just a, mis a misunderstanding that pretty much everyone does when they play this famous piece by Mozart, the Fantasy and the Sonata, the actually published at the same time, maybe not composed at the same time, but maybe, I don't know, you could help me, published you're, at the same right. time as a single but, opus, right? Yes, you are right. They were not composed at the same time, but they were published under one single opus number, which Mozart gave it as opus 11. So then the question uh, ar uh, arises, why did he publish two pieces, which he composed about half a year apart? Why did he publish them together? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the big question. And then, of course, the next question is, where is the melody? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I um, continue your questions and then... Uh, I, I wish I had a piano here, but I'm upstairs in the uh, on the third floor where I don't have a piano. But yeah. I I had to come here because the internet here is much better than downstairs, right. and I don't want to uh, give you right. trouble. 
put that well, I w- okay. So we you set it up very well, and so the sim uh, sorry not the 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 fantasy and sonata published as a single uh, opus, and. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a level of insight that perhaps most pianists don't even think about. Maybe they just see a clump of notes and they just try to go from point A to point B. Well, and, and you're, and you're speaking... A, yeah, they have a good reason not to think of, of it because Mr. Kirchhell, who did the Kirchhell for Zeichnis, he gave them two different numbers. So one number is, and this is funny too, one number is 475 and the other one is 457. So, you know, so of course, a, a pianist who, who doesn't know any music history uh, will think that these, these are definitely two separate works. But Mozart didn't feel it like that, didn't mm. think like that. So, so Mozart must have known something. Which do, we people, know. do people generally think that these are two separate pieces? Is that the popular perception? It's not only the popular perception, but I talked twice with Alfred Brendel. And I was very disturbed because he went around the world giving piano recitals with these two pieces. And he put one piece in the beginning of the program and the other piece at the end of the program to make sure that it never enters the audience's mind that these pieces have anything to do with each other. So, you know, uh, <laughs> as you can tell, I'm not mainstream, but I'm not trying to be different. No. I'm just trying to understand the music. No, what, whatever is just the most accurate information is what we want. What is the truth? So what set you on this path? How did you even think about this issue? Uh, the, way, the way I uh, set about it is uh, you... You have to understand a little bit my background. I come from what used to be f- formerly the Soviet bloc. And uh, we, we used to hear all the great artists coming from Russia. Well, then it wasn't Russia, then it was the, the USSR. Uh, and uh, then, because I didn't have a piano there in, in my grandfather's birth village, I brought with, my, with me a complete book of Mozart sonatas. And I, I had this ability to read music and to hear it. I didn't really need a piano. So I went through all the Mozart sonatas. And as far as I'm concerned, that is where I really learned Partimento without ever knowing about it. <laughs> and I could, I could immediately tell if s- something was off, I, s- I would think, oh, Mozart couldn't have written it like that. that that's how deep uh, the, the uh, knowledge I acquired already when I was about 20, 12 years old. <laughs> and, and, that, and, and then I, I read about this letter where the father, Leopold Mozart, tells his son, you don't have to write big works. All you need is to write works that have the quality that is necessary. And then he mentioned this Italian word, il filo. And il filo, of course, means the connecting thread. And so when I heard about this connecting thread business, I try to see if there is a connecting thread in the in the fantasy. And if I played the top pitches as the melody, then there was no thread. And that is how, so it was completely based on voice leading that I, I was able to untangle the, the piece. And as you can see there, how, how strange that is. Mozart could have written that in two different uh, systems, the right-hand system and the left-hand system, but Mm -hmm. in measure two and measure four, he amassed everything into the (laughs) right-hand And that's Mozart's fault. No, it's not his fault, but uh, I... You could say it like that, too. From (laughs) our our contemporary eyes, it it is a flaw. And as a matter of fact, 
uh, he had the opportunity when he did his um, uh, list of compositions. There, he used both systems to write those notes. So he could have, if he had wanted to, he could have given us the, the actual correct voice leading, but he, he chose not to. And then the next question is, why did he choose not to? Well, because in, in those years when he composed these two works, he became a, uh, a mason, a Freemason. Mm. And it was a customary among Freemasons to, to do things in a hidden way. So, so, it, so this is one of the symbols that the Freemasons, uh, a central symbol, uh, of the Freemasons, uh, and uh, so if I want to to do something musically that would would be connected somehow with Freemasonry, then I would try to make my uh, the opening measures somehow to uh, to be a reflection of this symbol. Mm. Right, and so. Let me ask you about his. Uh, so I, I have your your article, some of the facsimiles. Um, mm, right there, you did. Can you describe what's what's in the facsimile? Yeah. So there you have the same opening, but this time written on uh, the two right hand and left hand stave, and and you can see there uh, the way he writes it. He simply goes by which note is higher and which note is lower. It's the absolute way you would print this today. And indeed, if you look at any Urtext edition, this is what you will see. And then when I, when I went through the piece, I realized Mozart could have given us the actual voice leading using both systems, or, the, or both staves rather, as you can see there now, the notes are the same, but, but they are arranged differently. And so if, if, we, uh, if you think of, of that uh, symbol you just saw, you, sell some, you see something going up, da, 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 and then in the higher registers, you see something going down. Da, 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 da. And the, on top of that, you have crossings of voices. That voice crossing, that is extremely difficult to perform on the piano in such a way that it can be heard clearly. Yeah. So for me, this is a purely performance question mm. that started the whole thing. It had nothing to do with f figured bass or, or tonality or anything just just i realized gradually that the whole piece makes total sense and not only the fantasy but the fantasy and the sonata together make sense and by the way mozart wrote first the sonata and then yeah. he wrote the fantasy but then <laughs> when he published it he changed it he put the fantasy first and then the sonata so there are all kinds of of things that should should uh, um, make us question why so many changes for for something that should be normally so simple. Mm. All we know is that the sonata was written in 1784, and the the fantasy was written in 1785, and he published them as a single opus, and he changed the order. So there must have been a compositional reason why he did that. Things don't just happen out of nowhere. As, as they would say, a wind doesn't blow and blown. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, uh, what are the, what are the, for people who just, what are the, the salient points that connect the two works together in terms of musically musically so people well, have this idea they're not connected so what are the point the major points that connect them well the major point is if you look uh, with the proper voice leading you realize 
the, the two works have it it's a monolithic theme it's the same theme in one it's the same theme in the other of course with the kind of variations that uh, are available to composers but I, I have one example. So of course, the the when you see that voice leading, you have to be so careful to to make it clear where the uh, this mi fa sola and mi re do si is to to be audible. If it's not audible, then it doesn't matter what I know. <laughs> see, <laughs> the notes are the same, but the interpretation is different. And when I say interpretation. To me, that's not really the right word because to me, if if I think in terms of philo, that's like like a law that somehow <laughs> the whole thing has to be connected, not just in the fantasy, but the two works have to be connected. So, because um, there's no melody, right? If that if you take out the melody and just play a bunch of chords, as it's just yes, exactly. In in other words, it's not just chords. That's the main problem with with uh, the people people thinking about this this music okay. you can okay. see there the differences be between the capital letters and the, the lowercase letters so if you if you look at the capital and the lowercase you will see that the two pieces have all the same pitches there is there is an e flat there is an f sharp there is a g there is an a flat and there is an E flat going to D, going to C, going to B natural. So it's absolutely, uh, it's like bang. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of these obvious things. Okay. Yeah, it, it should be obvious, but <laughs> you see how long it took. And of course, we, we have lost. Can you, can you explain the scale of, of the, like, are you, I mean, basically, I mean, this is Mozart we're talking about, one of the most performed composers in history, right. and right. this is, and also this sonata. I think a very one out of the, the all his piano sonatas. This is the one that Beethoven was really inspired by. Uh, probably out of the set is probably one yeah. of the more famous ones, and uh, it's in a, fact it, it's famous because also because it's one of the few sonatas in the minor key. We only have the A minor. And here we have the C minor. Let's see, what, what other minor sonatas do we know? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. What did other musicologists say about that? Well, I don't know what other musicologists say, but I'll tell you a, a real story. Uh, at some point, I joined the uh, Facebook thing. And, uh, <laughs> and then I, I saw uh, a... And I heard a performance of somebody who became my friend, so to speak. Like you click Facebook uh, okay. friend. <laughs> Facebook friend, yes. And then I, I pointed out to this lady that, by the way, um, you play that assuming that the high pitches is the melody. Mm -hmm. uh, but and then I, but I said I I have a a different view of this, and I sent her. Uh, what I what I basically uh, already uh, talked about uh, at a at a, a symposium celebrating the the life of uh, um, of uh, Malcolm Frager, mm. and after I sent her that link, she unfriended me. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yes. He just would not. That's harsh. Accept. She, she would not accept such a, a, a an idea. That's and, wow. And I'm, you, you see, you have to realize there is something, in some ways, tragic about this, because every pianist I know who recorded this piece, they all bring out the the highest pitches. Mm -hmm. So basically, especially when that person has, uh, meanwhile, uh, passed away. They have a problem because they left something which yeah. maybe is not uh, quite what Mozart wanted. So yeah, so it's a it's a difficult thing. <laughs> it's difficult for me because uh, if some people 
may say, well, you know, he just writes that, and it doesn't matter what he writes because you know, he he is entitled to his opinion, and I'm entitled to mine. <laughs> Didn't you present this information to Malcolm Frager himself? Oh yes, I did. And uh, see, Mal Malcolm Frager was an extraordinary musician, so quick, so incredible. I just sat down to the piano and played for him the the voice leading the way i interpret uh, i saw it i heard it and within just a few minutes he immediately understood and he told me you have to you have to write about it this can this has to be become known because it's a completely different piece oh Wow, a, com a completely different piece. I mean, come yeah, on, that's well, because well, in in yes. the sense that if I hear, I mean, can you, uh, you know, the, this thing about intervals for a musician is everything. Mm -hmm. I I often ask my students, what would you say if you went to a concert and if the orchestra instead of playing da 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 da, they play da 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 da? <laughs> would you accept that? No, of course not. So the basic things. So in that sense, uh, he, he felt that this is uh, absolutely uh, necessary information for any musician. We are talking about musicians. We are trying to understand the music. Well, like I said, Professor Sass, I mean, you're an unusual one. You actually seem to know a lot about music. <laughs> you seem to take it seriously. Yeah, which but, is... but you, also, you can have also uh, a different opinion, as, as people say today. And, and uh, when, when things like this happen, they usually don't like to, to deal, deal with mm. this, with a few exceptions, of course. Mm. Can, you, can you speak about um, CPE box harpsichord concerto in G major? Um, yes. I know that Mozart is quoted as saying Bach is the father. Um, but he, I know he really admired the other son, J.C. Bach. But but what about yes. this harpsichord concerto? And let me pull it up in the article. Um, yes. Let, let me pull it up in the article. And I, I wonder which... Let me. I'll find the page first. But why don't you talk about a little bit about that and the concerto itself? Right. Well, I was lucky that I met the Hungarian... Uh, forte pianist and harpsichordist who has recorded that harpsichord concerto of C.P.E. Bach. And uh, when you look at, at, at what uh, C.P.E. wrote, you can very clearly see that <laughs> Mozart has, let's, let's use that word, honored C.P.E. Bach by taking over his music. <laughs> He changed it, though, and that is yet another point which made me think. Because in the CPE, everything is just chromatically shifted. Mm. The way you can do today with a computer, you shift something up and down, and, and then it transposes automatically. Well, but when Mozart shifted the things, he didn't transpose it exactly. He changed it. So he has one version uh, of the of the first two measures, and then a different version for the next two measures. So again, why? <laughs> uh, can you talk about Richard Bass? Um, who did, well, did you meet him, and did you share this with him? No, I didn't meet him, uh, and I and I I say it out flatly that I am not a uh, what you would call a Schenkerian. <laughs> I don't analyze music using Schenker's ideas of of uh, of analysis, but I was so pleasantly surprised to see that a Schenkerian, who of course is is very strict in applying the set of of rigorous rules, that he comes up with the same uh, voice leading that I came up with. So so I I wrote to him. And uh, and so he said, well, yeah, he didn't he didn't go any further than just the beginning, but he realizes, of course, that uh, you can go beyond the first four measures and and find out 
those musical ideas, which is always uh, <coughs> four notes. It's either four notes up or it's four notes down. And you will find those four notes everywhere from beginning to end of the uh, so fantasy and sonata. And you see, uh, the very nicest thing for me was I looked at the manuscript of uh, the sonata. The sonata was finished by Mozart. The, the fantasy wasn't yet written. So he finished it and he put a double bar line. Then he writes the fantasy. Then he crossed out his final measures. And what did he do? He took the opening notes of the fantasy and he put them to end his sonata. <laughs> you see, there you have uh, that typical thing about the snake swallowing its own tail, which wow. is, which is the the uh, uh, that image of the of the Freemasons. There you go. You see, you see how how there are the two two snakes. There is an ascendant and there is a descendant, and one has a crown. And the other doesn't have a crown, and one has wings, and the other doesn't have wings. So, the, but yet, the two sides are uh, related to each other because each one eats up, swallows, so to speak, the tail of the other one. So it's a perfect circle. Mm -hmm. And the most you... fantasy and sonata gives that perfect circle. You know so much about the the. You have a, such a deep understanding of the repertoire. Do you see? Well, but, but you know how many years it took. <laughs> <laughs> do you? How often do you see stuff like this in Mozart? We can just start with Mozart. But do you, do you see a lot of this playing his works well, over the years? Mozart Mozart was the master of Il Filo, so in that sense. This is nothing unusual. This is just normal in Philo. It's mm -hmm. just that it's interesting how he will connect two works to make a one unit. That I, I have not, not seen anywhere else. And my assumption is that this connection was indeed uh, having to do with his becoming uh, in 1784 and 1785, he, he becoming a uh, in 1785 already they called him a master mason mm. so that was already a, a uh, higher acknowledgement from mm. the, the lodge and by the way uh, since you asked me about Liszt Liszt was also a freemason in many many lodges <laughs> <laughs> but of course that, those freemasons were very different from the freemasons these days, <laughs> they, right. they, they were really interested in music they, they, uh, and in, in doing good things, uh, you know, for, for society. I, I don't think they were so interested in, in, uh, in other, other things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, you, you mentioned, um, okay, so Il Filo. So in our mm -hmm. last interview, I asked you about it. But that was near the end of the interview, and we were kind of wrapping up. And you, right. I, I, we had only like five, ten minutes to really talk about it. And I, I yes. recently posted an excerpt of that interview about Il Filo, yeah. and there yeah. were people in the comments discussing it and trying to understand because, in a way, it's you could really take that phrase in many different ways. Il Filo is he referring to just? composition is he referring to other things granting so maybe you could really be clear and clarify the, the the definition or at least your definition of what he you think he meant by yeah. il filo well uh you know uh gierdingen wrote a uh chapter on il filo but my analysis and gierdingen's analysis have nothing to do with each other because my analysis is based on uh, voice leading and on what that implies. And what it implies is, and this is where, uh, where, where uh, 
Alfred Brendel is is absolutely right. He talks more about character than about anything else. So these two pieces have something in common, and the common thing is the character. So there is a, a gloomy character in this piece, a, a gloom that you will find in very few of Mozart's works. You, what is the thread, Ariadne's thread? Well, that is the, the uh, mythological uh, thread connecting the evolution, the planetary evolutions of, of the universe. And that implies that not only humans reincarnate, but even planets reincarnate. So basically, the Il Filo was started out as an occult concept uh, having to do with the, uh, the planets as they evolve, evolution, and, and the opposite of evolution is involution. So we have Evolution, involution, evolution, involution, evolution. So this is wh where a planet becomes outwardly noticeable, or in the next time it just di disappears as, as if it had never been there. And then it re-emerges through another uh, evolutionary cycle. So this is basically, uh, this is something uh, that goes beyond what normally uh, people talk about. Because Ariadne is a Greek exactly. Cretan princess. Um, right, yeah. We're mm -hmm. delving into aesthetics and something grander, right. essentially, is what you're saying. Right. Okay. Um, so Chopin takes this up. I mean, he there's there's you, you write in your article that there is uh, as well a sort of um, homage, perhaps, to uh, that's what to I call <laughs> Yes, yes. Can you can you speak a little bit about Chopin's uh, homage in your opinion? Well, well, what's interesting is that we like to put people down. If, for example, in the English edition of Chopin's Scherzo Number no. One, a title was included in that edition which does not come from Chopin, then we immediately say, "Oh, those editors have added this an authentic thing." For, uh, and they called it. They called it uh, the. Uh, I I forgot now. What what was the the uh, name of the of the English edition? What did they call it? Um, oh, we can go to. Maybe it's on the Wikipedia. I'm not sure. Let's see. <laughs> but, no, but but uh, this is this is extremely interesting because uh, basically. That person, whoever edited the English edition, they they knew that uh, this this has to do something with the uh, diabolical and the divine. And you know, this is this is when you talk today about the Chopin scherzo number one. How many people will you say that know that Chopin actually used? musical symbolism in the same sense as did many other composers so so where you have the uh, the tritone and and the uh, then the uh, polish christmas carol well here is a, a typical example chopin never told us that he used up a, a polish christmas carol for the middle section of the piece at least but not yet, in words right yeah i mean it's obvious that it's there. It just Chopin never made it public, just as he didn't make it public. Why, at the end, the last uh, chromatic scale, he put what today we would interpret as accents, and you would have a chromatic scale, and in that chromatic scale you would accent the B and the E sharp. Now, if you are in B minor, I call that a tonic triton, because the first note is the tonic, and the second note, the E sharp, is, is the triton. And here is the, the strange thing. 
one of the highest, in fact, the highest person involved with, uh, with Chopin, a, a Polish gentleman. My student was playing the Chopin scherzo and at the end made these accents very clear. And what was the reaction of the, of the gentleman? He said, oh, forget about the accent. Just play it like one big glissando. Mm. In other words, ignoring the composer's notation, that is considered normal. Look at those accents. <laughs> Actually, the way, the way Chopin wrote those, he wrote them as diminuendos, because most pianists don't know that Chopin, in Chopin's time, they did not have accents. What? what? Say Haydn, that again. Haydn, Haydn didn't have accents. Uh, Mozart didn't have accents. Chopin didn't have accents. Accents started coming in, in, uh, in, into use at the end of the 19th century. There was no, no accents before that. And so what, uh, what Chopin wrote is whenever he wanted an accent, he wrote diminuendo signs. And the diminuendo became eventually an accent. You'll find, you'll find this in Schubert. If you look at Schubert's wow. manuscript, you, you'll see there too. Wow, <laughs> that's a bombshell. And you see, we also have the, the Triton thing. If you look uh, after, uh, in the beginning of the uh, Chopin scherzo, you have E sharp, F sharp, B, and then he reverses it, E sharp, F sharp, B. <laughs> but you see, if, if you count in three, and it's one, two, three, 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 one. So, so you have the two against the three already. This is, this is all symbolism. So to, to assume that these composers uh, didn't know anything about symbolism, they knew everything about symbolism. But, but, but rather than, than doing what they, they wrote, we tend to say, oh, well, just play it like, like a glissando and make a crescendo, that's all. So again, again, it is for, for me, everything I write, as I told you, I'm not trying to be different. I'm just trying to understand the music. And, and it is because of that, that I ended up spending a great deal of my life because I really don't know how to write. So every time I publish something, first I go, and send it to, to various people to, to make sure that it's more or less uh, understandable. So it's clear what I'm trying to say. You said um, yeah. things that could be very helpful for students is to perhaps to look at the arrangements of Haydn's symphonies by one J.P. Salomon, and maybe to look at the, figured, the, the, the continual uh, figured realizations. Um, I think, uh, can you, are those accurate? There's sometimes, some people have said maybe the figures don't always match the realization. Um, and we, we don't know exactly if the figure, was it done by him or, or do we know the hand? But what can you give uh, a little bit? Yeah. Uh, when we say realization, then we mean that there are no figures present. So uh, we know that Haydn accompanied the performance of several of his symphonies playing basso continuo on the forte piano. And of course, uh, back in those days, you had two conductors. You had the violinist who conducted with his bow, and you had the pianist who played the basso continuo. So of course, when you have a situation like that, then Solomon is right next to Haydn, and the two of them conduct the ensemble. So <clears throat> for us to assume that Solomon didn't really know, know what he was supposed to do, well, <laughs> but he was right next to Haydn. Uh, so he, he was a fantastic musician. So why, why doubt? Yes, OK, I found some mistakes, printing mistakes. It, but it's only printing errors. That's all. It doesn't mean that Solomon didn't know 
And by the way, this is the beautiful thing. How many violinists today would be able to make a continual realization? Tell me. Well, if they don't, they have to play the keyboard first. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, we, back then you didn't have all the TV and all these, these things that took you away from music, but you really uh, would be surprised how much those amateurs knew about music back then. Mm. That was their life. They they had not much else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, speaking of, uh, look at look at look no, at go ahead. Mozart's sister. She was basically an analphabet in the beginning. She didn't know anything about anything, but gradually, she learned everything about music, and she became one of the most thought after accompanists in in uh, uh, in. In, in anything, in orchestra, in uh, chamber music, in song, ev everything. So these things can gradually be learned. And it doesn't matter whether... whether you see, here is the, <clears throat> the, the big, big uh, sad thing today. They have brought out already the facsimile edition of Beethoven's uh, handwriting of the <coughs> full score of the Emperor Concerto. <clears throat> and in that first measure, Beethoven puts a huge figure five above the bass. And if you know what that means, that means the pianist is supposed to play that first chord. How many pianists do you know who play anything during the first measure of the Emperor Concerto? They don't do it. Because they got this completely wrong idea that a concerto means a boxing match between a conductor and the, and the pianist. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. The pianist is a member of the orchestra, so when the orchestra plays that first chord, so-called orchestra, then the pianist plays, both in the right hand and in the left hand, the, the pianist plays an e, a B-flat. Now, if you want to look carefully at the orchestration of Beethoven, are there any B flats in, in, the, in the instrument? Not one. So the minute you don't play the B flats on the piano, you do something different than what Beethoven wrote. Right. I, I'll go one step further. In the, in the fifth Brandenburg Concerto of Bach, the, we have two, two different versions of the of the piano part, written out by Johann Sebastian Bach. One is an early version. One, uh, the other one, the one dedicated, is, is a more elaborate one. Well, in the in the first one, you definitely have, because it's in D major. So the the only person playing that that uh, A, which is the fifth, is the pianist. Bach too orchestrates his orchestra exactly the way Beethoven did, with no fifth in, in the harmony. He gives the fifth to the basso continuo. Wow. It's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> you think what, what's the common thread between the opening of the Emperor Concerto and the fifth, uh, um, uh, what, what is it? Uh, Brandenburg Concerto of, of Bach. Oh, this is not the manuscript. Uh, this is the first version. Well, you see there, you don't have this is this is a just the the orchestral thing, but you don't have this is not the the yeah. the solo part. Bach yeah. wrote the solo part, and he in the solo part he put in those those notes that are not there in the in in. You see. So that's, that's, again, this is typical thing. You show me something, but that's not all what Bach wrote. Mm. There are important things missing, important things missing in the Brandenburg Concerto and missing in the Emperor Concerto. Uh, so Professor Zaz, if a new student comes to you who is not a great pianist but doesn't know about Basso Continuo, how would you suggest they learn Basso Continuo? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll start with the bad news. <laughs> Okay, I have for 30 years now tried to teach different students 
how to do bus of continuum. And some of them eventually learned what notes to play, what would be the right way to improvise for uh, that bus of continuum, or if necessary, even to write it down and have something um, you know, to guide you. And the minute you hear them, either with a second piano or with an orchestra, try to play basso continuo, you know what happens? It doesn't work. And you know why it doesn't work? Because these people have no chamber music or, or ensemble mm -hmm. experience. And if you don't have ensemble experience, you better not play basso continuo because you can immediately tell that what you are doing there, you play the note, but it has no connection with the orchestra, so-called orchestra, because you should be a member of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. This is a problem. People don't understand that in a concerto or in a symphony, and I mean symphony, I mean there we have the Haydn symphonies, there was always a pianist involved. You had a job, you had a paid job, so to speak. Today we have nothing. We don't get paid for, for being a, a member of an orchestra. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody hired me to, to, to continue in, in the symphonies of Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven? You know? So you're saying in even like uh, Mozart G minor symphony or four, uh, you know the famous ones, there would be somebody on a forte piano playing basso continuo. Well, that was the that was a norm. I mean, when when uh, uh, let let me let me give you a historic thing, and this puts a, a question very clearly in focus. And the question is, if you look at the piano concerti of Beethoven, you mm -hmm. find that he has almost nothing in the scores in the first, second, third, and fourth piano concerto to tell you that you are supposed to play basso continuo. And suddenly, when you have the fifth piano concerto, he writes out every little single detail, when to play with the violoncelli, when to play with just the double bass, when you play with both of them, when not to play at all, what to do, <laughs> you know, the whole, 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 whole detail. Now, you tell me, what kind of thing is this? Uh, it, because, uh, unfortunately, there are some, some very uh, bad things that were written on basso continuo. And the worst of, the, of what was written there comes from Paul Badura Skoda, who, who made, at the end of his chapter on basso continuo playing, he said something, I paraphrase now, I mean the words, the printed words are there. He basically said, if the orchestra is good and the conductor is excellent, then you don't play basso continuo. Hmm. Wow. And he was a very influential musicologist performer. That is the problem. He, is so, he was so influential, and I'll tell you how influential he was. In the early recordings of Alfred Brendel, he was playing basso continuo. And then comes out this, this book, and he stopped playing basso continuo. Because if you do that, you're not... Because Accurate, if you do that, you you're just conductor, you are no good. <laughs> That's why wow. I need to play the basso continuo because you are no good. Wow. That's that's I mean that's huge. I mean that's enormous. Uh, the 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 implications for that for classical performance. I mean just just take that well, out. I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I have had a few conductors with whom I played uh, the, uh, Haydn and Mozart concerti. And I was supposed to play a Beethoven concerto too. Uh, I can tell the story of that too. Uh, and in the beginning, all the conductors said, there is no such thing, basso continuo, you know. <laughs> and then I just said, let's try it. Let's see how it works. And after I played that, they said, hmm, that, sounds good. <laughs> oh wow! It sounds you know? good. <laughs> and, and in fact, I got one 
one letter from one conductor who said afterwards, you know, you know, it's so funny that now I'm missing the Bastogne Concerto. <laughs> that's, what, that's what C.P.E. Bach said, right, in his treatise. He said that yeah. you, you, he said, if it's not said, there, you notice it. Exactly. When it's not there, you notice that something is missing. And you have a fantastic recording on your YouTube channel. I just want people to go to uh, where you talk about the, uh, you play a Mozart, um, which one is it? It's a Rondo by Rondo. Mozart. And, I played that as a little boy. <laughs> I and, started my career with that. <laughs> and people can, they can go online and see many different people play the mainstream way of playing it, which is, but yeah. when you hear this, your performance with the basso continuum, it just feels like, like that a missing piece of the band is finally joined in and it's it feels full <laughs> again. Uh, and you know, honestly, I yeah. can't hear the original mainstream way of hear of playing it because I was where's the where's the basso continuo? It's missing. <laughs> so mm. I, I think people should really check that out. I'll put that in the link in the description. But yeah, mm. I mean, it's absolutely true. Can I ask you a question then? Um the for the concerto for Beethoven, I mean, are we talking about even his symphonies? Eroica, Symphony that, 5? That, that is a question which uh, one uh, Australian ensemble decided they are going to record all the bit five uh, uh, Beethoven concertos with basso continuo, okay? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, the question became, uh, shall we also record Beethoven symphonies? And mm -hmm. here is the thing. Uh, well, what's the order of their publication? Were they around the same time? You, yeah, I need to tell you about why Beethoven suddenly writes so many details about the fifth piano country. Because most tell me. people don't. Okay, this is very important. So here is Beethoven doing a big, big concert, performing his fourth piano concerto and the fantasy for piano and, and orchestra and voices, Opus 80. And the, the concerto goes okay. And then comes this fantasy for, for piano, orchestra, and voices. And at some point in the music, Beethoven switches from a normal four measure uh, periods to three measure periods. And then something happened and the, the, the thing started falling apart. And uh, there are plenty of... Uh, of um, um, people who wrote about this imagine that even though Beethoven was already somewhat deaf, but he realized that the ensemble is not working together. So he jumped up from the piano and there were then where they didn't have electricity. So they had two boys holding candles and he started waving with his arms and he knocked both of those boys and they fell to the floor. And then the whole audience started roaring with laughter. And he, he, at that point, he must have decided, never again shall I play my own concerto in public. So that's why suddenly he decided in the fifth piano concerto, he must delegate everything. He must delegate the cadenza, he must delegate the angenge, he must delegate the the ornamentation, he must delegate the basso continuo. And he wrote all that into the, the uh, manuscript. Incredible. Wow. You know, music, music, uh, and by the way, uh, I attended at that uh, conference honoring Martin Frege. Uh, I met a, a gentleman who, who gave a, a paper called 200 Years of Terrible Cadenzas for Mozart's <laughs> piano concertos. And, you know, what is he talking about? Well, the man really went through all the libraries imaginable and he tried to find some kind of cadenza that uh, was written in a style that would be fitting for a Mozart concerto. And he couldn't find a single cadenza. He, 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 uh, I talked to him, he told me, I think I, I uncovered something like uh, like uh, hundreds, if not thousands of, of <laughs> and they are all absolutely crazy. And were and they then, like romantic, very 
they were romantic and and there was even one cadenza which which was like a 12th in a 12th tone style <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes nothing so, nothing fitting for uh, nothing of fitting. that period not, of that interesting nothing absolutely nothing fitting did, hummel didn't write any cadenzas or 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 well he did he did and that's that is then the the thing is that by the time Hummel came along, already the style of the mainstream music has changed. Mm. So Hummel's uh, piano writing was less restrained than Mozart. You know, Mozart is basically a composer who was able to make a point with the fewest numbers of notes. Mm. When you go beyond him, uh, notes, notes start multiplying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The emperor would not have. Uh, I mean, the the emperor said too many notes to Mozart. So imagine what <laughs> <laughs> emperor would not have liked the, the, what came up next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. But yes, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. You 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 oh, finishing I, I was just going to point out that the in the beginning of the emperor concerto, there's a beautiful thing about performance practice. So here you had the first cause, every orchestra, and of course, pianist also is part of the orchestra, so everybody plays. Then you have these arpeggios, and then you come, come to the uh, subdominant. And what, the, what did Beethoven do in the subdominant? He plays the chord, then he puts rests, but what does he put under the chord? He says pedal. In other words, he introduced this idea that a pianist does not have to hold with his hands the sound. He can just use the pedal and the pedal can can carry the sound through. It's, it's the typical romantic pedal use. It was introduced by Beethoven. Mm. Wow, I mean, this is because they, incredible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is yeah, incredible. It's, it's incredible. Yes. Uh, well, anyway, uh, if I ju I'm just teaching right now a student who is doing Mozart uh, C major, uh, Kirchel number 467 concerto. Mm -hmm. And we, we just looked at the handwriting and we found out that Mozart did not miss any single time where, where the basso continuo had to be played. He wrote it in very clearly, call B and then B double dot. And double dots back then meant an abbreviation. So call B meant call basso. And you were supposed to play it even though in the piano it, uh, part itself, there are no notes because that was a time-saving device. The composer only wrote out the string bass mm -hmm. and then he put in the piano part call, call B and double dot and that meant of course i don't want to have to write out twice the same notes so yeah. i'll just put it in the strings and by the way i discovered one document of mozart where he didn't put the the uh, the bass notes into the string part he put it in the piano part and then he wrote to the strings call uh, that you play with the piano <laughs> yes! wow a reverse so there you tell. <laughs> You know, wow. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, did you, t Robert Levin, you, meant, you mentioned him just now. Yes. Did you tell him about this fantasy and sonata? What did he say about that? He knows, he knows everything about all these things. I mean, <laughs> in his know. new edition, does he talk about the, because that was, I guess, I guess it's not a sonata. It's part of it, though, but... Uh, um, uh, you, which one you mean now? Because remember uh, the the um, the fantasy and sonata. I think uh, does yes. the sonata have the that also that voice leading, or is it just the fantasy? Oh, well, the the uh, the, the voice leading in the fantasy is unique in the sense that it crosses okay. voices. Okay, you have voice crossings which you don't have in the sonata. Okay, so okay. But, but he knows, uh, right? He he knows what you're. Oh, what absolutely. You're... I mean, Robert Levin is just about the only person <laughs> now 
who plays basso continuo in in all the classical uh, works yeah. and he can actually improvise you know he was a a student of Nadia Boulanger i mean anybody who studied with Nadia Boulanger would certainly know how to do a, a basso continuo yeah you know yeah. I, I remember one little incident uh, robert uh, came to play here in Freiburg, uh, a Mozart concerto, and then he ended, added the, the cadenza that he improvised using a, a style similar to, to a Saint-Saëns. <laughs> and then I told him, hey, you know, why do you end up the, the cadenza that way? Why don't you just do the, 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 the usual trill on the dominant seventh and then finish the piece. <laughs> and of course, we, we laughed at the whole thing. And then, then he just uh, he just said, well, you know, I... <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> I just felt like it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you can talk with people who know, and with, uh, other, other people would get angry and... Uh... Yeah. You, okay, uh, you brought up Nadia Boulanger. You met her, and in fact, not only that, she praised your performance of a Debussy well, piece. Can you talk was, about that? that was, yes, that was <clears throat> a thing that back when it happened, I didn't know who Nadia Broche was. Oh, again. okay. <laughs> okay. So, I, you know, this old old lady comes to me and says, uh, uh, "By the way, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you, you, I, I liked your uh, Debussy performance of the I, I played." Uh, etude pour les notes répétées, mm. uh, etude for repeated notes, and she she noticed. She said, "Of course, uh, your technique uh, all, all was very good, but I especially like that that you made the construction so mm. clear. You know, it was the the uh, the way the piece was put together. Mm. And of course, now <laughs> I." <laughs> I'm very proud to, to have met her, even if, if this incident was no more than half a minute. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she, she just she just mentioned that you know this was for her something special that somebody could play the the piece technically and musically yeah. so well together. Yeah. Well, you're a special pianist. But it reminds you, me I of. Was, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was then. 1967, that was at the Enesco International Piano Competition. I was wow. 19 years old. Wow. You know, that reminds me of like uh, Gottschalk meeting, playing in front of Chopin and then Chopin going to shake his hand and wow, you're going to be, yeah, <laughs> you're great. <Yeah. laughs> that just, I, it's got those vibes. Um, can I, can I, you're Hungarian, so I want to ask you something. Um, there's somebody yeah. that I, I, I guess recently discovered, and uh, he's really a great musician, a famous one, uh, Ernst. See, I'm going to butcher the name, so I just want you to say the name for me. Um, uh, you know him, of course. You me featured oh, him on yes. your channel. Okay. Well, in Hungarian, we would call him Dochnányi Erne, but okay. he then, he then uh, to to make the things easier for the Western audiences, he 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 took on this. Ernst von Dochnanyi, because see, when you have the word von, usually it implies some kind of uh, uh, like an like aristocratic. A, exactly. I, like I, Ludwig I van Beethoven. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, Wait, so I, anyway, I just thought he was, I mean, I was just looking for it people who are good at sight reading and I was just exploring sight reading. And he's of course a ridiculous musician, composer, sight reader. Um, but did you know, can you tell me your, do you have any connection with him? Can you speak about him a little bit? I'd love to get well, your insight because you probably have a much better insight to talk about him. Well, uh, there is one person in the, in the world who has not only become an, a, a, uh, uh, who, who who has not only written a uh, excellent biography in three volumes about Liszt, but this is Alan Walker. Alan Walker has also took the trouble to to bring out re recordings 
of Dohnai performing, and some of them in a, a normal mono, and some of them in stereo. In other words, he he has taken the trouble to to uh, show what a fantastic musician Dohnai was. Because you see, back in the days when I was, for example, in, uh, in, in I see I I'm Hungarian, but I was born in 1948. And by 1948, Transylvania was already part of Romania. So, so uh, I, I've, I've never was able to know anything about Dohnanyi because back in, in those days, Dohnanyi was a forbidden composer. You couldn't oh, play. Okay. Yes, wow. it was forbidden. He became the only country which didn't bar his uh, compositions to be played is in England because he, he concertized so much in England and when those people heard things, of, uh, false rumors about Dohnanyi being an anti-Semite, anti they just laughed about the whole thing. They, they couldn't take that seriously. Yeah. And so, so Dohnanyi only became known after he emigrated to the United States of America and then he, he started teaching in in Florida, and and <clears throat> that's how. To today now there is no more, uh, no more anything against Dohnanyi. So mm. rehabilitated. So you, but he's a rehab monster musician. I mean, a ridiculous. Yes, and the only thing I can skilled. say to you, <laughs> yes, one skill I don't have. I'm a terrible sight reader, and I'm angry at myself because I could have taken a, a sight reading class of one of the greatest accompanists ever and he told me oh my class is already full i'm sorry <laughs> and then and i could have asked him that won't you let me just sit in your class and listen <laughs> well you know i i was too literal <laughs> so, i think you're too modest but but I mean... you, no 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 i don't know how to and there is a reason also for this because i have such a quick memory that very often after I play something, I already have most of it in my memory. So, <laughs> so to me, I don't have time to sight read. <laughs> Is it photographic? No, it's not at all. I, yeah. I hear it in sounds. And you have absolute pitch, so that will help, I think. Well, this, this is a, also a, a double-edged sword. I remember when uh, the first time my grandfather wanted to introduce me to Americans, but my grandfather only had a Viennese grand piano. And the Viennese grand piano was half a step lower tuned than the, the normal. <laughs> Baroque, uh, what is that? Oh. Uh, yeah. So yeah, 415. I, I, studied play, I studied to try to play on it, and I found myself that I studied transposing things Half a half a step. By the way, I had I had an amazing ability to transpose. I could transpose anything into any any keys very early on. How do you, in, in my how, life. how what where did, is that? Just a gift from God? What happened? <laughs> yeah, I got a gift from God uh, because and and I also had the gift of seeing music and then hearing it inwardly. I didn't have to have a piano to to wow. do this. And then. This the way I found out about this. What a nuisance this was! Mm -hmm. That uh, I tried to sing in a choir, and if the conductor didn't give the exact pitch of what the piece was written in, but you know, put it a little higher or lower, yeah. I couldn't hardly could sing with them because it bothered me. How can I say no when I'm singing me? <laughs> so and then and now now I'm I'm uh, seventy five years old. And I have a very interesting phenomenon to tell you about. Yes. Uh, this is a phenomenon that happened to Richter. Richter was, and I, I talked to a person who was at the concert. Richter was playing. Sviastoslav well, Richter, right? The famous. Yes. Yeah. Richter, yes. He was playing the uh, well tempered Klavier. And suddenly, he, he, this incredible shout. And he walked off the stage and he brought in the music. Because Richter started having this problem of hearing all the pitches higher than written, half a step higher. 
as he got older. And then I found out, reading about this, concerning Prokofiev, can you imagine that the old Prokofiev, before he, he passed away, he was hearing everything two and a half notes higher than it was actually was. It, wow. It's a tragedy, and I have now that problem. If I don't, uh, if I hear normal sounds, everything is half a step higher. But it, but I have still the ability because of of my relativity, mm. I can say to to myself, okay, you hear that, but doesn't matter. Now imagine that that is something else, and then once I tell myself, okay, that's a door, then it's a door. Then I can deal with it. Another thing was with this Chopin um, fantasy mm. that where I think of it as a, a homage a Mozart. Yeah. Well, I'm playing that fantasy. By the way, uh, this is a very important thing. Uh, we're putting down this English edition because they added some programmatic words to the title, but, but, if you look at the editions of the fantasy of Chopin, Opus 49, you find that in England it was advertised as being in A flat major. Yes. This is what I wanted to ask you. Yeah. Why in is it France, in F minor? In France, where Chopin was, in France, it was advertised also in A flat major. And in Germany, we have the, the manuscript which served as the, from which they actually published the, the piece in mm -hmm. on German territory. And there is nothing in it to say that that piece is in F minor. So this whole thing about the so F minor. Where did, that, where did that come yeah, from? Then? Well, yeah, people just put <laughs> stacks because, because they see that the beginning is in F minor. Or they think it's F minor because you know, you know what I, I said, an F, A flat, C, in, in what tonalities do you have it? You can have that as the sixth degree of A flat major, or you can have it as the first degree of F minor. And yeah. so they saw that they interpreted the first chord as being in F minor, and they called it from then on uh, fantasy in F minor of Chopin, which is nonsense. Who, but who did that? Where did that come from? I don't know. Just, just people assume, you know, in the days of Mozart, Mozart didn't say piano concerto in C major. Mozart had a different method. He said XC. And XC means starting out of the key of C. That's all. No key, no, no tonality given. Oh, you you're dropping all these, <laughs> these musical yeah, red well, pills. It's very important. <laughs> it's absolutely very important to realize how how. That oh in the goodness. minds of the old composers, they knew exactly that nothing has, this is my, my basic definition to students, nothing has in and of itself any identity. And they knew it. <clears throat> I did. <laughs> you are dropping these red pills, these musical red pills. <laughs> <laughs> crazy, crazy. Oh, my goodness. Um Okay, what, what did I wanted to ask? I wanted to ask one thing, and I just kept going on and on. I kept asking you more questions, but um, I, I guess the, the question, um, what was it? It was regarding um, uh, list. Okay, the final one, the transformation of themes, a compositional yes. technique. People mm -hmm. associate that with your countryman, Mr. Franz Liszt, um, mm -hmm. but you write in your article, it was undoubtedly practiced already by Mozart. Yes. Well, because we have a in the list sonata right in the beginning, uh, we have a crossing of voices, and voice crossings is that if you if you interpret the beginning of the Chopin fantasy correctly, there there you have a very strong crossing of voices. One voice going up to the octave. And the other one, four notes going T up uh, down. Yeah. So you have all this really crossing like that. And so so to me it it seemed unfair for Liszt to be um, to be credited with 
transformation of themes and and all of that when actually Mozart Mozart did it before him. Hmm. Yeah. Um, By the way, uh, this is this this is another funny story. I'm, I'm playing share with York, me. a Mozart sonata. Uh, right now, I don't remember. I think it was in D major, and I'm playing the last movement, and I don't know what happened, but in a very short time, I'm at the end of the sonata of the movement, and I couldn't. I I get out. And I, I'm thinking to myself, what did I do? And so afterwards, I took the music and I tried to figure out what happened. So in my mind, somehow, my mind figured out that I can cut from one piece, <laughs> one place, to another place in the sonata, and nobody would notice. <laughs> <laughs> and it was completely unwell. It just yeah. happened. My mind just spun. <laughs> <laughs> figure that out. Uh, I ask. I keep asking you about Hungary, Hungary, Hungary. But um, also, there's Romania. I think is a, is. Uh, I can you just why don't we end off with that? Uh, just speak about Romania musically and um, how it influenced you. And yeah, you has. I, I mean, like for in, you just have a unusual. Mu unusually musical perspective on, on, on that would that is I find very refreshing, uh, very very refreshing. And so I just talk about a little bit about your childhood and the formative stuff that that, right. that helped create you. Well, uh, just as I said, uh, I ca came from a Soviet bloc. I was I was by the way woken up in the middle of the night with the whole apartment shaking and those were the russian tanks going to to uh, to hungary where there was that uh, instantaneous uprising to uh, and uh, so um that that was a a uh, personal experience which I even remember as a child, I was so scared, and I, and I asked myself this question: What would happen if a, if somebody was in the street at that time? Would the would the tanks roll over them? Would they actually stop? <laughs> you know, things, things like this. That's a crazy! You know, wow, I can't know, even in imagine. In the mind of a child, looking at all all these tanks going by for like half an hour or so. Uh, well, anyway. Uh, I'm, I'm That's 56, is that right? 1956? 1956. So you were like eight years old, seven years old, something yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, I was a little boy. And, okay. and uh, I'm lucky to have had uh, a piano professor in uh, Romania because, as I said, Transylvania used to be earlier Hungary, but then it became Romania. So I was, I was lucky to have had a uh, piano professor at the uh, conservatory in in my city of birth, and she was such a fantastic musical influence that uh, if you ask me where where did I get my major education as a musician, as a mm -hmm. pianist, everything, I got it from that those people. Do you know that her husband, Antonin Cholan? Was actually the teacher of Celi Didache, and and uh, uh, he was a student of Artur Nikish. Do you know Artur Nikish was a conductor who who conducted around the time when Liszt was still uh, alive. <laughs> really, I mean, uh, perfect. I have that book. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so she. Uh, this Romanian lady, she has she gone she's gone through all kinds of music schools: the Russian, the the German, the Austrian, the French. Her last two teachers were Lazar Levy and Alfred Cortot in Paris. Oh wow! Okay. Yes. So so I I got really a a mixture of influences. Of every possible pianistic school, mm. and I chose from everything. Uh, and I didn't know at that time 
watch Russian school. And by the way, this whole thing about Russian school, it never even occurred to me to call something Russian school as they did in Freiburg. For the longest time, there was this Russian school every summer. The thing is, if you if you knew intimately, uh, and you heard, uh, we heard every year at least once, at least once we heard Richter Sviatoslav Richter, mm -hmm. and Emil Giller Spain. Well, you never heard two pianists so different from each other than those two people, and yet they both studied with the same teacher. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. me, that is the greatness of 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 a teacher that you don't end up uh, coming coming getting the the same you have your personality and you, yes yeah. they they they, uh, they uh, lift you up uh, as an individual hmm. i always hear stories of teachers from the eastern bloc being like very like ah! yeah <laughs> very strict and and scary yeah. and yeah no she was not like that yeah. uh, except that at one time when I was about 15 years old, I, I had already studied with um, Professor Cholan for three years, and then I became interested in physics and chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I spent so much time with physics and chemistry that I hardly practiced. And then she told me, you don't get any more piano lessons. Oh. And so, so for three years, I, I was left on my own. And then I realized after three years that I'm not really interested that much mm. about physics and chemistry and I went back to music and then she took me back again mm. and, and uh, yeah so what well, can I ask you something about the so-called Russian school uh, there was a comment by Rachmaninoff he yeah. said that oh the reason why the Russians are so good I mean I'm paraphrasing is because they mm -hmm. all have mastered the Hannon exercises. I mean, I'm sure you've heard that quote or something. Uh, do you? What do you think of the Hannon exercises and uh, well, as a part of a pedagogy? Yeah, the only thing I was told by one of my professors is that Hannon was not a pianist but was an organist. So those were mostly exercises for organists, mm -hmm. and for that reason, I, I, you know, you know what kind of a mind I had. I was learning in school as a as a early teenager. I was learning about permutations of numbers, and so I said, "Okay, I have five fingers in the right hand. I have five fingers in the left hand. So how, why don't I find out how you can permutate five notes in so many different ways?" And I wrote out every single permutation of notes for each hand, and then I started to practice them to see, and I found out something very fantastic. There were certain permutations I I almost couldn't play. It just was going against my, my mind. Others, easy, but some of them I couldn't mm. play. So that, that much about human psychology. <laughs> Difference between mathematics and what the, the human mind is, is uh, well, capable of. Did you have a comment on Hannon in terms of its efficacy? Do you th what do you suggest people do to build up technique? Uh, Czerny, Carl Czerny. Czerny. And which particular? You, you know Beethoven. So, uh, because Czerny is short and it's always a musical entity. I like and Czerny too. <laughs> musicalize, if you musicalize it, uh, then you you can you can teach so many things ab about music to the students based on Czerny exercises. With Hannon, you, you have no music; you have just mm -hmm. formulas, endless formulas. Yeah, but no music. Any particular set of studies by Czerny you like? Yes, I mean the the simplest thing is Opus two two ninety nine is the School of Velocity. It has four books, and I, I played almost all of the four books. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you can see in the last book of Czerny already the switch from what I would call the classical and the romantic pianism. In the beginning, 
starts everything in C major at the end, he has a, a, a etude in D flat major. <laughs> and it's completely, it's, 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 see that's, that's like Beethoven. Beethoven, you have the C major concerto in the beginning, and then at the end you have E flat major concerto, which is already uh, like a, a romantic type of yeah. pianism. Okay, Professor Sass, concluding thoughts. I leave the floor to you on your article and just in general, great thoughts of musicianship for 2024 for all the students and all the musicians who, who listen in. Well, my next major project is to bring out a new edition of the Liszt Sonata, which will have all the right, not just the right notes, also the right co concepts, which which we can absolutely, with based on the autograph manuscript of Liszt himself. We know, based because we have this manuscript, we know what Liszt really meant. And it is possible to bring out a flawless edition. And that's what we are trying to prove, that yes, indeed, the Liszt sonata can be performed correctly. And because until now, the Liszt Sonata, if you look at 99 or even higher percentage of articles written on the Liszt Sonata, everybody says the Sonata begins with descending Phrygian and Gypsy scale. Now you tell me, what, what, is, what is the contact, uh, c common thing between a Phrygian scale and a Gypsy scale? I mean, it just, and then they'd say, oh yeah, that's because, you know, Liszt was was uh, uh, he took on his his uh, cloth of a of a priest and that's the phrygian and then he he was also enamored by the with the gypsies and so that's why he wrote a phrygian and gypsy descending scales but it's not so convincing for you nonsense it's absolutely nonsense there is no no gypsy scale at all in the Lissonata, if you know what's going on there and luckily enough, there, there are a few, a few theorists who already figured out Liszt's compositional method, and they know very well that there is no gypsy scale in that piece. <laughs> so, um, I, I love gypsies, but please don't, don't put them in context that, that are not correct. Yeah, that's, that's where I... I uh, uh, I hurt my left hand. I was going to the climax at the end of the piece, and I, I had to play an octave. And I played it as normal with fifth finger and thumb. You know, here is my... Yeah. Yeah? And then a nerve got out of place. Ooh. And then a few days later, I found out that Liszt advises students when you want to play some, some very loud octave, put your fourth finger and fifth finger next to each other so that the fourth finger supports, supports the fifth yeah. finger. So you, <laughs> you do, yeah, so it's just amazing yeah. what practical advices Liszt mm -hmm. uh, was able mm -hmm. to give. And so yeah. I, I find mm -hmm. that absolutely amazing. Right. Out. Okay, well, well, I guess. Well, yeah, well, the great Professor Saz, I mean, you have yeah. given so much great <laughs> advice, and it's been a fantastic conversation, and uh, it really was a pleasure for me. And please come back when you have that the, that article out. We'd, I'd love to talk to you about that article. Well, the article will come out probably end of February, but our edition, that will take some time. Okay. So, and of course, we, we, we need to find a way to, to have it published. <laughs> the great Professor Tibor Sass. Yes, thank you yes, so much, sir. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> don't, don't add great, okay? Just you, you can, No, no, no. I remember I said, no, like, no. Maestro Cyprian Katsaris. He was the same as, no, don't call me this. No, no. <laughs> no, I, I, I think yeah, the respect is due. And thank you so much for being on the show. And your great articles, which I encourage people to read. Professor Sass, thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much, Nikhil, for having me on your show. It's really 
nice to come back and uh, with new new experiences that have have happened. How many years ago were we? Oof. Two yeah. two year over two years ago, and it was only audio. Is that all? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness! It sounds like so much has happened in those uh, <laughs> short time. Okay. Well, thank you. There so will much. be a third. I am sure there will be a third as okay. well. Okay. All right, Professor Sass, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.